section of this forum in Chile. Our title is How Can We Represent when we have a representation crisis. I have to tell you that there is simultaneous translation. We will have presentations in English and Spanish. So for gringos, we have also English into Spanish. So if you do not speak English, we will have simultaneous translation, also English, Spanish. And I think there's a special channel with my weird Spanish to a Spanish that could uh, be understood but I don't know what channel that is. The constitutional process in Chile is being followed in two parts of the world, a process that is not just offering a possible um, exit to the crisis um, that the Chilean democracy is suffering, but the possibility to be more inclusive as a system, more participative and responsive. So the destination of this process in Chile will, echo, will be echoed beyond the borders of Chile. In my opinion, thank you for, uh, to the strengths of the state institutions and the um, uh, rule of law. Maybe some innovations will have consequences on Chilean democracy. New law will be fulfilled and will be followed. And it's not that in all the countries of the region, we think that Chile could become a sort of a laboratory in the Americas for this century, being able to generate some lessons and even some models which are helpful in other countries, not just in Latin America, but also in the North. And in my country, we have a great need of a constitutional reform. But during the whole constitutional process here, Dr. Class will offer a platform for an open debate, and we expect it will be a high quality one about the dilemmas that Chileans are facing when they are rethinking their constitution. We will have a series of webinars and conferences about key subject matters like how to restore legitimacy in a system that uh, has lost the public trust. How can we improve and expand uh, the social and political representation? What's the role of the institutions? It could be democracy institutions that are direct democracy and participative. What is the best possible way to deal with uh, the social rights that we could learn from cases in Brazil, Colombia? What is the effect of the expansion of social uh, rights in the economic model and the entrepreneurship in Chile? So the idea is to bring together uh, academic, uh, the academia, political people in Chile and the United States uh, to debate these subjects and other subjects. So we want to open for debate. So the guests will always come from different political views and ideologies. So we expect to see you all in all the sessions, hopefully, especially I am really enthusiastic about it. So before we could start, just a little bit of housekeeping. I, I don't even know how to say housekeeping, housekeeping in Spanish, but there will be simultaneous translation. The session is being recorded now and the video will become available through the YouTube channel of Dr. Class. And I didn't know that we have a YouTube channel at Dr. Class. So if you have questions for the panel members, you can send that in the Q&A option in the Zoom. I want to thank Dr. Class and this great uh, team, especially our office in Chile. We thank especially the director of our office in Chile Marcela Renteria, Marcela, who is the inspiration and strength behind that project. And thank you very much also to the rest of the team, Jimena, Gabriel, Jillian. And I want to thank our extraordinary uh, consultative committee, Veronica, Figueroa, Claudio Fuentes, Claudia Hines, Juan Pablo Luna, Cel Rodriguez, Son Serrano, Sebastian Soto, and Mona also Harvard Association of Chilean Institutions. Thank you for Luxich's Scholar Foundation for your support. And also 
several co-sponsors, Constitutional Laboratory of University Diego Portales, the Public Law Department and Government School of the Institute of Political Science and the Department of History at Catholic University, the Public Institution uh, of Universidad de Chile and Millennium Institute for Data. And I would like to thank to these great and excellent panelists, local and international. We have the moderator today, Claudio Fuentes. Professor Fuentes is a collaborator in Constitutional Laboratory at the Universidad Diego Portales and Doctor of Political Science from uh, uh, Chapel Hill, uh, North Carolina University. The interest has been oriented to study political processes in Chile and Latin America with an approach in the last years in the dynamic of institutional changes. Being part of the presidential anti-corruption uh, process in the last government of Mrs. Bachelet, and with other things, he's been Luxich Fellow and visiting scholar in Harvard 10 years ago in 2011. Claudio, the word's yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, it's so nice that you invite me again if uh, we've been for 10 years away from Harvard. Come on. So the idea of this panel, we I think we have a great and interesting panel and how to represent, how can we represent in a crisis of representation and the constitutional process that we are starting. When I went to Chapel Hill by the end of the 90s, Chile was a model the model to have the representation, the model of uh, political parties, uh, together with Uruguay and Costa Rica highlighted, I could remember mingling and schooling book where Chile was always mentioned between the most stable countries with a political party system that was strong. Something that uh, was questioned later on during the 2000s, many scholars uh, started reviewing these things about Chile and then it collapsed uh, the trust of parties, the anti-politics uh, sen sentiment, and many of the parties will hide uh, who they are to present a candidate. And in the constitutional context, we see how it emerges as lists of independent people, but also the phenomena of looking for representation, a representation that will be unheard of in a constitutional convention as parity, first time in history, we will see that in the world, reserve indigenous people seats, uh, some quota for uh, disabilities people. So they are looking for representation. And the great question for the panel uh, is very interesting. What are the consequences of this for the democracy uh, system, for democratic system, this crisis of representation? What will this mean for the Constitutional Convention, but also for creating a new political democratic system or the renewal of the political democratic system. What we have, and I will be very brief introducing you guys, um, and we will go to a sort of eight minute each uh, round table. We will start by Kenneth Roberts, who is a PhD in political sciences, Cornell University professor, director of the uh, Binning Core program for Latin American studies who has been studying uh, thoroughly the Latin America reference that is key for political parties, democratization, populism, etc. Jennifer Piscopo, a PhD in political science and the professor of the Occidental College at Los Angeles, California. She was a fellow, Dr. Class fellow with representation subjects, democracy, gender, and also, I think she will contribute with a great um, view about a dimension that is so present in the case of Chile today in our current debate. Then we have Isabel Aninat, who is an LLL of Columbia University, a lawyer, 
a dean at Universidad Adolfo Ibáñez Law School. And she was a researcher in uh, public policies and ethnicity, also part of her research agenda. And that's where we met, in fact, in several events and seminars. And I think it will be also an interesting view. We have Veronica Figueroa, PhD in Management Sciences, and an associate professor of INAP in Universidad de Chile, member of the council, Dr. Klaus Fellows, fellow as well, working in public policies for the indigenous people. And she is the vice president of the University Senate at Universidad de Chile. Thank you, Veronica, for being here. And finally, we have Manuel Antonio Garreton, political soci sociologist, as he would like to be introduced, PhD in sociology in France, professor of uh, FLAXO, the social sciences uh, um, department of Universidad de Chile and the national uh, award of uh, social sciences and humanities uh, among his uh, wonderful and thorough uh, career uh, working in democratization in the case of Chile and many other subjects. With this wonderful panel, we would like to have a first round of five to eight minutes with the question that we handed. And we could start in that same order and we will go another round if possible and if you're allowed. Kenneth, we could start with you now. Leo and and I uh, thank uh, Dirk Glass for the the opportunity to be part of this forum today. Uh, I think these are very important questions for thinking about where Chile is going with the Constituent Assembly and what it means not just for Chile but more more broadly for democratic politics within Latin America. I I want to start by citing one of my fellow panelists. I hope he doesn't mind, but I remember reading Manuel Antonio Garreton way back in the late 1980s during the period of the democratic transition in Chile. And I remember Manuel Antonio telling us that we, we shouldn't think of the Pinochet regime as just another military dictatorship, that we had to understand the ways in which it had created a foundational project. It had, had tried to refound Chilean politics for the long term. And that meant not only a, a set of, of institutions that would restrain the democratic regime, but also a certain uh, economic and social order associated with the neoliberal model of development. I think what we've seen in Chile, I would argue beginning with the high school students uh, movement, uh, the Pinguinos in 2006, and then moving to the university student widespread protests in 2011, and then more recently with the October 2019 uprising, I think we've seen three different cycles of social protest uh, that have ended by basically breaking that old order, right? That order that uh, had been founded at the end of the Pinochet regime. So I would, I would argue that we have seen nothing less than a mass insurrection against that order, both in its political institutional expression and the underlying social and economic foundations of the neoliberal order. Um, and so I think that we're in a situation where there is the potential for a real refounding uh, of the social and economic and political basis uh, of order within Chilean society. But when I look and see it, what the options for this are, uh, I think as, as a political scientist, we kind of work with, I think, three different models of institutional change, right? There's an incremental model of change where you take the status quo and you tinker around the edges, but you basically have minor incremental gradual cumulative changes. There's another model that we call critical junctures where there's a, a sharp rupture or a break with the old order. And then you create something that is, that is considerably new and different and you move it a different direction. And then there's a model that we associate with the work of, of Levitsky and Murillo and others that talks about serial displacements, where there's no real new order that congeals or institutionalizes, but rather you have a lot of institutional fluidity and whoever gets in power sort of rewrites the rules of the game according to their own interests. I can't say at this point which of those three different ball games we're in in Chile. I could see processes of institutional change going in either of those three different directions. And I think it really depends 
on how the social protest movement is able to translate itself into the institutional arenas. And so far, what we've seen, I think, with Chile's protest movements, they've clearly demonstrated their disruptive power, right? They've demonstrated they can paralyze and basically break down the old order. What we've not yet seen is their constitutive power. Do they have the, the, the ability to break with the old order and to rebuild a new set of governing institutions, institutions that are more representative and that begin to repair the cleavage that exists before the society and the state. And so I think that's what we're looking to see because I think in Chile, there's an enormous gap, there's a chasm between societal actors that have been mobilized and the institutional arena. Uh, all of the political parties transversely, I think, uh, have been challenged by this process. And so far, what we've not seen with the social movements in Chile is their ability to enter into institutional arenas, which is where elections are won or lost, which is where governments are formed, which is where laws get passed, which is where public policies get enacted. Right? We've yet to see the ability of the social movements to translate their strength in civil society into these institutional spheres. So they've demonstrated that they can disrupt, that they can paralyze. They haven't demonstrated their ability to enter into new institutional spheres. Now, clearly, the Constituent Assembly creates the opportunity for that, new spaces for representation, uh, a large number of candidates who are independent, as Claudio mentioned, uh, an equal representation of women uh, uh, within the Constituent Assembly, reserved seats for the indigenous populations. And clearly they will be debating both the social basis of the new democratic regime, in particular forms of social citizenship uh, around things like healthcare, like education, potentially labor rights, things that are not really uh, the pension plans. These are forms of social citizenship that were not part of the old order that was handed down from the Pinochet regime. Uh, but there's gonna be a lot of debate clearly around the forms of social citizenship and then clearly debate around the, in, the, the institutions for both participation and representation. All right, are, are there new ways of engaging uh, and creating spaces for these civil society actors to participate in the deliberations around public policies and the implementation of reforms at municipal levels, at, at regional levels, at the national level? Are there consultative bodies uh, uh, conventions and consultative arrangements that can be formed so that there are new spaces uh, for these different voices within society. But my, my fear about the process is that even though there's an opportunity to rewrite the rules of the game and to, and to really refound the democratic regime in ways that are more inclusive and more representative, my fear is that these energy coming out of the social movements will continue to find it very difficult to express itself in the institutional arenas um, in ways that will really give us a, a, a refounding and, and push in a different direction rather than just simply a, a shuffling of the, of the institutions. You, you create new institutions, but you found them over the basis of the existing very unequal power structures within Chilean society so that you don't really heal uh, or close this profound gap that exists between society and the institutions. Um, so I see the signal from Claudio. I think I should probably stop there. Uh, but that's those are just sort of the opening statements I wanted to say about where I see the situation uh, evolving in Chile. Muchas gracias, Kennedy, y por la responsabilidad de entender mi signo. Thank you, Ken. And thank you. Thank you for understanding my sign. It has been quite interesting in terms of the challenge and how social becomes a political action. And that is one of the great debates that we have had in society for so long. In uh, Latin America in uh, general, Jennifer. Bueno, buenos días a todas y todas y muchas gracias a Dr. Class y los colaboradores en Chile en los Estados Unidos por la invitación a hablar en este foro hoy. 
Eh, para hacerlo más eficaz voy a hablar en inglés, pero eh, el power está en español. Y bueno, muchas gracias. So I want to speak briefly about um, representation and inclusion in the constitutional process. And so the crisis of representation, we can think about actually as a crisis of exclusion when many people feel that the traditional political elites, members of Congress, party leaders, no longer understand them or no longer represent them. And we know from political theory, we know from empirical research in political and social science, and we know from the experiences of everyday people um, that representation needs to be inclusive. And it is actually the inclusiveness of representation that gives greater legitimacy to democratic processes and to the political uh, process that happens when um, representation convenes. So as you probably all know, um, the women in Chile, specifically a network of Congresswomen, legislators, journalists, activists, and academics uh, demanded that as part of the constitutional process in Chile, that there be gender parity. And so women opened this debate at the end of 2019 when the Chilean Congress was discussing the plebiscite and discussing the options to put before voters. And so what the women won in those conversations was the promise that for the candidates for the constitutional selection, uh, constitutional election, so for the candidates selected by popular election, that there would be gender parity. So every party or every list of independents by district would need to present a list that had women and men's names intertwined. So the Pinochet era constitution that this process looks to replace was written with just two of 12 women in the room. It's not quite different from constitutions elsewhere in the world that were written with none or few women in the room. But what Chilean women insisted here was without women, there is no constitution. And of course, that these processes of democratization could never again happen without women. What I want to point out is actually this idea was not new to Chile, but it is an idea that links women's participation to the quality of democracy. And this idea emerged in the 1960s and the 1970s as part of second wave feminism in Latin America, but also across the globe as part of the broader processes of democratization that were started to unfold in the world in that period. And the argument here is that if democracies respect political rights, and if political rights are the right to not just elect, but to be elected, and certain groups seem systematically less likely to be represented, then there's a violation of political rights that's occurring. And the right to be elected is the right to have access to positions of decision-making power and to influence in the design of society and the design of public policies. So from this point of departure, women in Latin America fought for mechanisms to ensure not just their right to elect, but their right to be elected. Because women in the founding democratic elections across the board in Latin America never attained more than 5% of the legislative seats. So Argentina became the first country in the world to adopt gender quota, a gender quota in 1991, a rule requiring that political parties nominate 30% women, and many Latin American countries soon followed, except for Chile. So here you see the effects of Latin America's overall adoption of gender quotas throughout this third wave of democratization. That gender quotas raised the proportion of women in Latin American parliaments from about 9% on average in 1990 to 30% today um, in 2020 and 2021. So today there are actually 10 Latin American countries that have elected or will elect their national legislatures with gender parity. And five of those legislatures are, have actually achieved or gotten close to gender parity. And that's Mexico, Nicaragua, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Costa Rica. And of course, Chile was behind in this process. Um, Chile did not adopt its first gender quota until the process where the electoral system was reformed in 2015 and 2016. So in that moment when the binomial system was finally removed, there was a window of opportunity to add a gender quota. That gender quota was added of 40%. And we could think about this as a first effort or a part of ongoing efforts, but a very large effort to address the crisis of representation by starting to open up the representative process to make it more inclusive. 
But of course, as the protests show us in 2019, um, that reform of changing the binomial system of adding a gender quota was too little too late. So in the parliamentary elections of 2017, um, when that 40% gender quota was implemented for the first time, about 23% women legislators were elected from a 15% in the previous elections without the quotas. So with more women in Congress, there were more women legislators present in 2019 to pressure for the gender parity rules for the elections for the Constitutional Assembly. And so here I put a screenshot um, from the account of Deputy Daniela Sicardini, and um, this is women in 2019 um, in the Congress in Valparaiso, and they're chanting in Spanish, somos, somos más de la mitad, en la constituciones queremos la mitad. And so I think if going to um, Kenneth's point about Chile being a model for democratization going back 30 years, my colleague Lisa Valdez, who I believe is listening in, has pointed out that if we think about democracies as not just having free and fair elections, but as creating rules to include and empower all citizens, then maybe our sense of how democratic countries are changes. And the point that Chilean women made was that Chile had practiced democracy since the departure of Pinochet for about 30 years, but they had done it without women and they had done it with very few women. And so it was time to change. So the final rules um, for gender parity in this process, um, the lists for the candidates have to be headed by women. Even though voters in Chile will exercise a preference vote, um, the symbolic power of having women first on those lists is dramatically important. And it is far as I know, the first um, rule in the world that requires that lists be headed by women, not part of the list, but all of the lists. Second, following um, lists headed by women, that men and women's names then have to be integrated using what's called the zebra or the zipper system. And then finally, after the election, there is a best loser system to ensure that parity is not just respected in the candidacies, but in the results. So by district, if there is a district that does not elect 50% women, once those votes are tabulated, the worst, the, the worst winning man, meaning the man that won with the least number of votes, will be bumped for the best winning women best losing women, meaning the women who lost with the fewest number of votes. And that substitution will occur until gender parity happens at the level of the district. Now, as many of you know, just last week, Cervell approved 37 lists that didn't respect rules one and rules two. And there has been a question to Cervell about why these lists were approved, um, violating the rules, and we're waiting for the answer right now. Um, and then I quickly want to mention other mechanisms that are very important for inclusion of other traditionally excluded groups, the 17 reserved seats for Indigenous peoples, and a quota for the candidates of 5% for people with disabilities. So just to wrap up, this process is going to bring in uh, new faces to reconstruct and rebuild democracy in Chile. And I want to stress that these new faces are not necessarily uh, do not necessarily lack the expertise to do this job. They come from important sectors where there is expertise about constitutions, about public policy, and about justice. And so we have to be careful not to conflate new faces with a lack of expertise. And hopefully we'll be able to dig into this more a bit in the Q&A. Muchas gracias. Perfecto. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you very much, Jennifer, for, for your time. Uh, it was perfect. And y yo creo que fue muy interesante. I think it was very interesting to see this because this is not something that um, we're seeing now. This is something that uh, we have to see uh, in Chile and in other areas of the region. Isabela Nat, um, thank you. Thank you. Please uh, remember to put the questions in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Claudio. I would like to thank for the invitation and the opportunity of being here. 
And as Claudio said, we have a very short time, five to seven minutes. And I would like to show a couple of ideas um, following up on uh, my on the previous speakers. And I would like to start with something Kenneth uh, commented, and that is um, representation, institutionality, the great gaps uh, between mobilization and political arena. So the thought here is well and we see we we point out once and again we don't see the text in political science but um in many current books on the importance of the parties for democracy the on democracy shared democracy that we need strong parties and um many times um these um, uh, the slogans go towards um, another area. So this is a phenomena. And the parties tend to bring together the worst uh, things uh, from society. And we have a full concentration of all the things that we need to change. And uh, this shows a growth of, um, uh, of lack of uh, trust. And this is a space of, um, of, of liberation where we have the parties and policies coming together. And as Claudio was saying at the beginning, we have a criticism and this is interesting. It is interesting. Uh, it comes from um, most of uh, the great majority of uh, people and the elites because many that uh, belong to a party, they hide where they belong to. And um, now we don't have those that are that go against their own party. And um, I would like to go back to a question. June 22, in 2015, almost six years ago, um, President Bachelet presented a reform to political parties. And this was done uh, along with other reforms that changed the electoral um, system and went to proportional binominal system, a um, change of uh, funding, a policy of uh, politics, funding of politics and a reform to the system, the party system and established a permanent uh, funding to political parties. Claudio knows this. He was part of the Engel Commission where they discussed this. So all these reforms um, happened between 2015 and 2016. So I came back to prepare this um, only five minutes to talk about that, the history or the background of that uh, law. This is um, what uh, President Bachelet sent uh, as a project, as a bill, uh, she pointed out the importance of the political parties to the um, democratic system because they are an instrument of uh, citizens' participation and um, uh, necessary actors for public debate, generates programs, gives, uh, provides uh, or uh, gives candidates or presents candidates, and also the existence of uh, political parties in Chile what has been the role of the parties to build um, Chilean democracy. Chile has characterized for political parties, institutionalized, stable, if we compare it to other countries in the region. And then uh, we show the deficit on the um, uh, parties. This is a party system that is highly closed and uh, has not been part of the changes political parties go through a very complex situation. They're weakened and uh, they need greater transparency vis-a-vis -vis the uh, citizens and their own affiliates. This is quite interesting because if I don't tell you that this was from July 2015, you might think that this is something that was written yesterday or the day before yesterday and it shows the main efficient deficiencies on political parties in this mess messages. 
It talks about restricted role of the parties, how the law um, gives some um, uh, at the end of the day shows a lack of transparency in funding the political parties for vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the uh, population and the lack of mechanism to include uh, young um, uh, people and women in their internal structure and also the principles of internal democracy and um, talks about funding, funding problems that has to do with permanent funding. And it is interesting, it is interesting today with the Constitution project. Well, what happened? Because what we were looking for is for key issues in representation, in alternance, and uh, we invested on the parties. We added funding a new way of funding campaigns and do this in a permanent way. So what were the effects and changes? Did uh, we achieve that? What happened? What happened with the, those that uh, saw the gap between the citizens and the elites and regarding the movement? Uh, 12, um, 2012, and um, all the um, uh, protests for free education. And we saw a great distance between what uh, the citizens uh, thought and what um, the political par parties thought. Were they able to get close to the citizens after these reforms? Why today we still have a perception of a closed elite uh, closed and uh, in spite of the efforts, why these steps forward that were so celebrated then did not percolate, did not leach through the rest of society. And this is key for constituent uh, discussion. And um, I think democracies uh, need to think about um, the mechanisms and that uh, has a cost and implies a cost. I can't, I'm not saying that um, independence shouldn't exist here. It is that they exist and uh, it's part of the convention, but only parties allow what we can do in terms of grouping interest and um, also the um, organizational structure that allow us to give continuity in time. And it allows us to see how do we move this forward. And part of the regulation of the parties is within them. And we have a lot of history. We have the history of the eighth uh, article that has been ruled out, um, 19 uh, institutionality, electoral institutionality that is gr of great importance of the parties, which was that before the tricella and now is CERVEL. En la convención creo que es especialmente relevante para el efecto sobre el régimen político. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué pensar en un régimen presidencial, semipresidencial o parlamentario implica necesariamente examinar y hacerse cargo de qué rol juega o queremos que jueguen los partidos políticos? Y aquí me voy a la última idea, yo sé que me queda un minuto, pero es eh, muy corto porque Jennifer ya explicó la variedad. Eh, mi pregunta es, y creo que hay dos innovaciones que son especialmente relevantes, ¿no es cierto? La variedad que explicó Jennifer... Eh, los escaños reservados, eh, y, y ahí lo interesante es que el salto de la paridad, de ser solamente de estas cuotas que explicaba Jennifer, a una paridad de resultados, eh, la pregunta es si eso se va a mantener como regla sustantiva hacia el futuro, si va a ser solamente una regla que opere para la convención, en los dos casos, ¿no es cierto?, o si esas reglas van a ser incorporadas Eh, ya al texto constitucional y, y de qué manera y qué cosas van a quedar como texto constitucional y qué cosas van a quedar dejadas a la ley. Y lo mismo quizás con algo que hemos comentado menos y que es las futuras normas de participación. Aquí Claudio ha escrito mucho más de eso, así que no me voy a extender, de participación ciudadana en la convención. Bueno, la misma pregunta es cómo se va a regular esa participación ciudadana en la convención, pero también luego qué significa en la constitución misma una constitución que ya incorpora posibilidades de plebiscitos, consultas comunales, por ejemplo, a través de LOCS, pero 
Eh, hay todo un mundo municipal, ¿no es cierto?, que ha sido explorado quizás con mayor intensidad en nuestro país, a pesar de que muy puntualmente. Y finalmente, solamente para terminar, el 11 de abril, ¿no es cierto?, que es la elección de los convencionales constituyentes, es también la elección de eh, alcaldes, concejales, ¿no es cierto?, municipales y de gobernadores regionales, que nuevamente abren nuevos espacios de participación, especialmente el caso de gobiernos regionales a los que no estábamos acostumbrados, y creo que eso va a ser interesante también de analizar, porque son fenómenos que van a ocurrir en paralelo y que pueden ilustrar estas eh, brechas entre lo que esperamos eh, y lo que estará en el texto. Creo que estoy en el tiempo, Claudio, así que... Súper bien... Súper bien, Isabel, muchas gracias. Creo que es muy interesante el, el, la conexión, porque por una parte Jennifer habla de procesos incrementales de reformas como la ley de cuotas que posibilitó condiciones institucionales para que después se abran otros temas como la paridad, y por otra parte también hay reformas contradictorias, eh, un poco siguiendo lo que Steve, eh, Vicky Murillo ha hablado de estas reformas institucionales que muchas veces backfire, que, que generan efectos contradictorios. Y ahí viene la gran pregunta de cómo se modelan las instituciones eh, para el futuro también, eh, y cómo esas fortalecen o no la democracia. Creo que es súper interesante ese, ese debate. Y me retaron, obviamente, hay un Q&A, un, una pregunta y respuesta, no es chat, es pregunta y respuesta, ahí tienen que poner su pregunta, ya tenemos pregunta y respuesta, así que seguimos con eh, Verónica Figueroa Huencho, eh, diez minutos, eh, perdón, ocho minutos. Muy bien, muchísimas gracias, muy buenas tardes a todas y a todos, un gusto realmente compartir y escuchar estas reflexiones que, que nos, que nos eh, señalaban tanto Kenneth, Jennifer eh, e Isabel. Eh, y a mí me gustaría, eh, a propósito ¿no? de la representación y estas tensiones, llevar al debate una posición quizás distinta, como mujer indígena, como mujer mapuche, y lo que nos ha tocado vivir también, ¿no? como parte de pueblos excluidos en este proceso tan interesante que se está llevando en Chile, ¿verdad? Y, y por lo tanto desde nuestra perspectiva, ¿no? como pueblos indígenas, para poder leer, para poder comprender el momento actual en Chile, es importante situar el debate desde una perspectiva del poder, pero también desde la perspectiva de la exclusión y de la perspectiva del rol del Estado-Nación, ¿no? que hoy cuestionan, eh, que están siendo cuestionados incluso, no solamente por los pueblos indígenas, pero que también ponen en tensión la institucionalidad que se ha creado al alero ¿verdad? de estos principios. Parto, por lo tanto, poniendo en cuestionamiento la supuesta neutralidad del Estado y sus mecanismos de participación y representación. Eh, obviamente, los valores que se han instalado con fuerza desde el modelo de Estado-Nación chileno no solamente ha llevado a la marginación de los pueblos indígenas en los espacios de participación y del debate político, sino que también ha legitimado, por otra parte, modelos de ciudadanía y sistemas, ¿no? mecanismos de participación que no dan cuenta de la diversidad jurídica, política, cultural que representamos los pueblos indígenas en las sociedades actuales, sobre todo como sujetos políticos. Y como en otros países latinoamericanos, el Estado chileno se ha construido siguiendo este modelo de Estado-Nación, dando lugar a un diseño de Estado y de sociedad sin los pueblos indígenas, ¿verdad? Y generando, o más bien yo diría, eh, eh, posicionando esta idea de una nación homogénea, entendida, ¿verdad?, como un conjunto de ciudadanos iguales, a quienes une una misma historia, quienes aspiran a un mismo futuro, y que por lo tanto es fácilmente identificable cuál es ese bien común, cuáles son los cambios que quieren impulsar. Y por lo tanto en esta discusión en Chile también es importante señalar que para los pueblos indígenas se da en una asimetría, se ha instalado una jerarquía epistémica, cultural, política, que ha incidido en el rol que esta nación chilena, que ha sido hegemónica, nos ha dado a los pueblos indígenas, como grupos todavía incluso a tutelar, ¿no? por no decir civilizar, propio del siglo XIX, buscando una incorporación muchas veces forzosa a las reglas del juego de este Estado-Nación. Por lo tanto, hay que considerar que en este debate que se ha dado en el caso de Chile, si bien se produce un avance con la definición de los escaños reservados, 
también se ha tendido a menospreciar las propuestas que vienen de los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? Hay un imaginario de una sociedad sin pueblos indígenas eh, y que tiende, eh, como yo decía, a excluir, a no permitir que se den propuestas que surgen desde nuestras, propios, eh, desde nuestras propias cosmovisiones. Y obviamente hemos echado de menos en el proceso de participación en la, en la Convención Constituyente estos elementos y generan, hay incertidumbre, hay ciertos temores respecto de cómo se dé esa discusión al interior de la Convención y cómo queden establecidos ¿no? los principios que buscamos defender en la Constitución. Recordemos que Chile es uno de los países que menos ha avanzado en el reconocimiento de derechos de los pueblos indígenas y así nos encuentra este momento constituyente. ¿no? Y hemos visto que en la discusión, sobre todo en torno a los escaños reservados, se negó nuestro derecho a la autoidentificación como un criterio de participación, se estableció un padrón específico con muchas restricciones en su configuración se excluyó al pueblo tribal afrodescendiente, ¿verdad? Y por lo tanto, de alguna manera, este es el punto de partida para eh, eh, definir ¿no? cuáles son los elementos que vamos a querer instalar en esta Constitución. Y obviamente, como se ha mencionado aquí, ya lo mencionaban mis predecesores, esto tensiona conceptos ¿no? como la democracia y como la democracia representativa construida desde una narrativa occidental, no desde eh, la diversidad de otros mecanismos de representación y participación que tenemos los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? Eh, los pueblos indígenas tenemos discursos políticos diferenciados del resto de la sociedad y claramente la pertenencia étnica se ha vuelto un factor clave en este discurso que tensiona las ideas de representación, de democracia, de nación, ¿no? de participación, y que demuestran la ineficiencia de la institucionalidad occidental hoy día en Chile para dar cabida a estas, a estas propuestas. La gran pregunta, por cierto, es si existirá voluntad, no solamente para evidenciar estas tensiones, sino también para generar, para impulsar los cambios estructurales que los pueblos indígenas estamos buscando. ¿no? Desde la perspectiva de la democracia deliberativa es importante que todas las voces tengan acceso al debate público y al debate político, eh, por lo que la representación de las distintas naciones es importante para los pueblos indígenas, pero a diferencia de lo que ocurre con otros grupos, y por cierto con, con las mujeres también, eh, históricamente excluidas, es que esta participación en esta nueva eh, discusión se debe dar respetando este estándar, considerando este estándar de naciones preexistentes al Estado chileno. Sin embargo, como decía antes, la democracia en su, eh, en su configuración actual en el caso de Chile no reconoce la dimensión de poder y la dimensión de exclusión en la determinación de estas mayorías versus minorías, por lo que se hace necesario explorar otras formas de participación y de representación que reconozcan, entre otros, el carácter colectivo de los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? The collective character of the indigenous people. So correcting limitations, the representation in regards to acknowledging and the indigenous people is a great relevance. It is important since the 80s we have propositions of different indigenous people in the Latin American case and in the case of Chile, especially from the changes that we have seen in the law. And we could see how the experiences today in Ecuador, Bolivia, Colombia, Mexico are key, not just because of the strategies these movements promoted, but also because of the achievement in concepts as the how uh, the states are and the existent, existence of different ways of political participation. So this opens an interesting door to see how the process will allow to have differences through 
our constitutional elected people through this special presentation. So the follow up of the process will be very important, but also how under the logic of agreement quorum, if it is two thirds, how can that then minimize the efforts in how these reserve seats are and to allow the differentiation uh, that could be part of the agenda? So we could take the representation, especially if we make progress, as we said, in the constitutional agreement, if we see in the systemic way what's in the constitution and how these acknowledgement will be or recognition, let's say that we see this uh, multinational state to articulate other key roles that are recognized in the indigenous peoples of the United Nations as exercising the free will and also the autonomy, which are key to participate in equal conditions in an intercultural agreements that we could see in this constitution. To be closing, maybe we need to say if we will have in the agenda to view the demands and the propositions. So if we look at the constitution, we need to show that none mention the existence of in the First Nations, that if we would have had different efforts, acknowledging different uh, bills, trying to recognize the indigenous people, there was none with the standard we expected and with the uh, uh, participation that we want to have in a key process as the one we are living now. So we see the half full glass, but we hope this project as indigenous people in our own aspirations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Veronica, and for respecting the time. I think it's very interesting. And many questions came out on the expectations of participation in the convention and how the expectations reality. We will ask questions about it. And now we have Manuel Antonio Garreton, eight minutes for you. Mientras resuelve el tema, Manuel, le recuerdo. Okay, we will wait a little bit while Manuel connects. We have a couple of questions already. And um, after the activity, uh, we have a group uh, from the council and some panel members that have an hour so as to have a more direct. Okay, Manuel, thank you so much. Um, I, wa I wasn't formally introduced. I did, I did, I did. You're right, you're right. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, uh, Claudio, and um, that have generated, um, that generated this, and the great problem is to speak at the end of these presentations that you end up repeating a lot, and um, sometimes uh, you say things that uh, were already said, and after hearing, uh, well, um, most of the people will not uh, want to uh, hear this uh, again, but um, I will let myself to present uh, what I had uh, my four central ideas. First, we are in the Chilean case, and this is what Ken said, we are in the crossings of two processes or two times in literature, 
that where it has in science, political science, they have different treatment. And that is um, a moment, a constitutional moment, constitutional moment understood as um, what's constitutional and constitutional text. And there is a foundational or re-foundational moment that has to do with the other aspect of the concept of constitution and the way society constitutes itself. Whether it is um, uh, becomes reality or not in a constitutional text. In the Chilean case, we are undergoing a process, a refoundational moment, and we had others. We had others since Chile came back to democracy with the government of Bachelet, the second government of Bachelet that simply got stuck and stayed there. But it was a time, a refoundational time that did not become a process. And uh, we are right now undergoing a process, a constitutional process that what it wants is to set up the rules of the game so the society can constitute itself. It is probable that this constitutional pro, uh, process will generate a constitutional time, a constitutional moment per se, and I think things are going that way. Now, the problem is if this constitutional time or moment will be able, maybe not to generate, but opening up a space, opening up a space, a refoundational process. Second uh, thing that I wanted to point out here is the crisis of uh, representation. What we need to uh, talk about in the second idea is that representation crisis is a problem, and this is a problem everywhere in the world. Basically, with transformation, transformation on the type of the type of society inherited by the uh, Industrial Revolution, French Revolution, and the revolution of, uh, of the Americans, as they call it uh, themselves. And that society is part of the impact on another type of society. And uh, we have a society, globalized society, uh, informational society, and digital society where we don't have a fundamental ways of work. And uh, we have uh, two principles that are fundamental, fundamental and that are contradictory to what we had in the industrial society, horizontality, and, um, uh, and also um, in, uh, how immediate these would be. They both mean a deep crisis, a very deep crisis in terms of the ideas or principles or institutional principles. Uh, society, digital society is a society where anomia is not a pathology as it was in industrial society, but it's the normal, it's a normal status. So what is um, what we have here in the principle of um, institutionality and immediacy. So that takes to a crisis of uh, legitimacy of all the institutions and also the idea of representation. And this is clear with vote. When people vote, people don't vote for one representative because two months later, they vote for an idea of what they want. And that's why we call this um, the um, um, anomie because they don't relate to a name, they don't relate to that, but they relate to something bigger. So um, the fundamental question 
that we're talking about uh, in, in these uh, meetings, uh, community meetings, to, uh, town halls. So how am I going to be there? How am I going to be there? How am I going to be? Uh, I want to go. I, I don't want anyone else to go. And this is a key point. It is a key point because I feel no one represents me and as no one represents me, I need to be there myself. And I need to be the one that says uh, whatever I want to say because no one will represent me. So it is a crisis, it is a crisis. And that is um, uh, what is um, being uh, seen in um, modern society. And this has some particular issues or aspects in the Chilean society. And this has to do with the crisis of legitimacy of a social order and also of the institutions, representation institutions that do, don't only come through these elements that are present everywhere in the world, but they are part of what we can consider a crisis of the social order from dictatorship corrected, but not uh, was not overcome by the governments of the opposition and the actors as well as a model of relationship between politics and society. So when we're talking about a crisis of representation, we need to ask ourselves if you want the tri triple crisis, because we have a, a crisis on representatives, we have a crisis of the represented, of those that sh are represented, and a criticism, criticisms to the representatives, because they represent themselves. And this is totally um, away from the uh, original concept of, of those that represent the rest of population. And then the other one is what should be represented? In the past, uh, you, re you represented people, the notion of people is uh, being replaced by uh, the people, but it's not, um, it's only a group of people, but not the people. So um, um, there is a group of people that do not feel part, they're part of a police. They're not, they don't feel part of what is the um, Greek concept of police. So this is a trend. This is where we're going. And um, what we have behind is a crisis in terms of the sense of democracy. It may, we may have democratic regimes. However, what's at stake here is the sense of democracy, what they respond to. Is it, are they responding to the ethos, the Republican ethos, the um, socialist ethos? They just respond to self-realization democracy, I uh, go for this because this will solve my problems. And if it doesn't solve my problems, I will not adhere to that. Two minutes. The third idea that I needed to point out is a change in the model of representation. And in the case of Chilean case specifically, and that to my judgment is key. This is key. And it's key because we go for one, from one model of imbrication where we have a certain identity and autonomy between social movement, citizenship, and political parties. And these were the cultures. And they went to a rupture. So it was a mixed up, an overlap, an imbrication, but there was after that a breakup, a breakup, civil society, and they're not, they don't feel themselves represented by anyone. And this is not a, an issue of trust or mistrust. The problem is that they reject, they feel uprooted. They don't feel attachment 
So they're absolutely ruptured. There is a structural rupture between um, politics, citizens, and um, the people. So we go from this imbrication model to rupture model. So this has been expressed in full expression during the uprising last year. And the solution, the exit came through the political class, but it was rejected at the beginning in society, but the political class uh, gave a step forward. So what did that mean? Well, society accepted that, it accepted this. So what does that mean? It means that we go to an intermittent, an intermittent process. So it, it is sort of a spasmodic, it's on and off. It's a type of an on and off relationship between politics and not overlapping, no imbrication, no working together. And it goes to ups and downs, big time un, un, uh, lack of knowledge, big time rupture, big time resolution, low times. So we go up and down and the social uh, uh, world accepts it. So now, if you allow me, how can we solve this? How can we solve the elements? How can we solve these elements? And the constitutional process would allow us to move forward. The first problem to face is the reconstitution of police, the reconstitution, because Chile is not organized. Well, it used to be an excluded um, uh, society, but today we have many, many areas to rebuild police. First, structural problem and a structural problem in these levels of inequality, we cannot build police. I don't feel part of the same society. If I am at Pintana or if I am at Vitacura, I, I don't feel part of the same society. We're not part of the same family. We're not part of the same society. Second, I mentioned we have the issue of inclusion and we have indigenous people, women, uh, handicapped people, and we need to be very careful here because this problem of uh, inequality has two dimensions, inclusion and representation. So we have moved forward, we have moved forward with issues in certain issues in terms of inclusion. However, we are not moving forward in representation. We are not. And the fact that we have a parity in constitutional um, assembly does not solve the issue, does not solve the issue or inclusion. Inclusion of half of the population. So the issue of inclusion solves inclusion, but not representation. So if it solves it, we would say that women can only vote for women because they only represent women and women are more than a gender and this happens uh, with the indigenous people it has a number of things beyond the interests and it should support chilean society should support the transformation of Chilean society. And in this sense, uh, we have not solved the issue of inclusion. Now, representation, as well as construction of police has to do with inclusion, has to do with inclusion with the four dimension, the four um, dimensions that we have at stake here, historical, historical that has to do with 200 years of an oligarchic society with the exploitation of the indigenous people, women, and that has to do with limited democracies. Second, the generation to uh, which it belongs, the generation from dictatorship to transition, Dictatorship to transition, where 
if we don't have a symbolic answer on constitution, uh, we won't have the post fascist, uh, fa fascist. And um, if we have a um, of dictatorship, that will leave, and not only the regime, because that would leave the people, all the others out, all the others out. And current um, generations, uh, the gener nowadays generation, they don't care about dictatorship. They don't care about dictatorship. That is the society, it's the society that is not mine. And it's not because it, it has been inherited by dictatorship because it's inherited from my parents. And it implies a full dimension, generational dimension. And that has to do with the future. So a constitution, uh, the one that we need to think about is a constitution that uh, we need to think as a uh, hundred years from now, or, or uh, that will imply work and uh, also the central area, the central fundamental area. Thank you. Um, I had some three issues, but um, to solve them, but uh, it's okay, I will stay here. Thank you, Manuel Antonio. And uh, after this finishes, uh, it will be close at two. And we have 10 minutes for a quick uh, round of uh, questions. I have questions for each of you. And uh, we will have some members of the committee led by Steve, so we can continue talking about the many questions we received. Over 14 questions, and I will choose them. A key questions that will be directed to each of you. So I will go for a round of questions, specific questions for each of you. And you can also react to the questions the others said. Um, I would like to ask you for uh, three minutes each, please. Hay una pregunta sobre, bueno, desde el punto de vista comparado, ¿tú puedes o Kenneth. has visto casos Kenneth, donde...? Kenneth, from the point of view of comparison, have you seen cases of social movement? Are we able to uh, translate or convert into political action to allow the citizens expression of social into the political or vice versa? Is there any experience on that, or this is a rupture that has no solution? Now, of course, in dialogue of what Gariton mentioned, Jennifer, a specific question about abortion. Is it possible in the constitutional debate to include abortion as part of the uh, Argentinian-like sort of discussion that has been so present in these last weeks. Remember that in our current constitution, it says the protection of the one that is to be born. So definitely it opens the debate about free abortion and that type of discussion. Isabel, Esteban asks, okay, do you see any type of solution to how can you imagine the institutional solutions for strengthening uh, political parties in the constitution? And then it starts of a discussion of uh, government regimes and how the political parties are strengthening in a uh, democracy or a democratic system. And Veronica, this is very interesting question. Maybe Jennifer also could be included with this question, but it is for Veronica intersections of feminism and indigenous. You started, I am an indigenous person. Uh, is there any dialogue? What is your perception? I think it's fascinating subject on that interaction and Manuel Antonio. And it aims to what you said at the end of the solution. There was a solution that is more structural, you said, but from the point of view of looking at the convention itself, do you see any possibility of this uh, norm of two thirds and the need to arrive to uh, 
ample sort of agreements, can we get agreement on and start thinking of what you said that we could establish some basis for the new type of police with some institutional limitation as it is two thirds for the convention. So please do it as a fast round. We will close and we will stay only uh, the ones that are interested for this informal forum that we will open. Kenneth? Say a few things about the intersection between movements and, and parties and in a, a process of representation. And, and in particular, in a context where there's a, clearly a crisis of representation, as, as we've talked about here. Thinking about that comparatively, when you look around Latin America, we've seen a number of other countries that have had mass uprisings, mass social protests, uh, Argentina, Bolivia, Ecuador, in particular, perhaps Venezuela. What's striking to me is that they, each of those other countries found a certain way of, uh, of trying to channel or represent the social discontent in the democratic arena. Uh, if you look at Argentina, at least part of the Piquetero movement ends up being absorbed by, by Peronism and the movement enters into decline. You end up not refounding the regime, but you get a, a transition in, in power. If you look at Bolivia, you get the movement essentially creating a new political party. And so the, the MAS emerges uh, with connections to a wide range of, of social actors and social movements. Um, in the Bolivian case, we haven't, that's something we have not seen um, in the Chilean case, I mean, Frente Amplio channels some of the discontent at the, at the bases, but it, it isn't the, the same kind of broad-based, movement-based party of, of what you see in the Bolivian case. And certainly none of the established political parties has had the, the capacity to absorb significant elements of the protest movement the way the Peronists did in Argentina. I, I, I think you don't see that in the Chilean case. I think there's an enormous gap between the established parties and these movements. The other solution to the problem, I suppose, would be the Venezuela situation. You, you basically have a populist figure who emerges out of the discontent and speaks for the movements. Um, and yet the, the sort of the institutional connection to those popular constituencies is, is, is rather weak and, and increasingly authoritarian over time. So when I look around, what, what's striking to me is, the, is the, uh, the lack of effectiveness that we've seen in the Chilean case of really translating that energy into civil society into the partisan and electoral arena um, and effectively trying to convert that in ways that can shape the new institutional rules and shape representation more, more broadly. Perhaps the most similar case I can think about would be the Spanish case where Podemos sort of emerges indirectly out of the Indignados movement um, and establishes itself as a significant party of the left within the system. And yet it's a relatively small actor that has to ally with others to try to get much done. But essentially it, it's part of a, a reconfiguration of the Spanish party system uh, without really transforming it from the, from the bottom up the way you got in a case like Bolivia. Uh, but I think they're looking around, we see different places that have had to grapple with these issues um, and uh, a very imperfect process of really translating the social energy into institutional arenas. I'll stop there. Hey, Jennifer. Jennifer, thank you. I am uh, rereading the question and answer. I'm trying to try, but also to go to the question itself. That is this question of are the candidates that are running now for the Constitutional Convention actually new, actually fresh, or are they the same um, politicians that we're used to seeing in, in Chile? And at least when I looked at the list, you know, I saw a lot of new groupings of candidates. There's these um, independents running under these sort of creative new list names, you know, the social movement independent list from Antofagasta. Um, but all I will say about, about that is that Peter C. of Ellis and I hope to have a clearer answer for you next week. Um, so watch this space. The second question is what will the representatives do once the Constitutional Convention sits? And so there was a question about um, intersectional feminism and, and how can feminism in Chile and the gender parity accommodate women in all of their dimension, dimensionality. And I think that that's a very important debate. And what I say to this is that we should absolutely make sure that the women are intersectional. The intersectionality is not just the responsibility of women in feminism. 
So we should be demanding the same kind of diversity among the men, that the men also reflect the LGBT community, the uh, community of people with disabilities, as we do among the women, and that diversity is not just the responsibility of women. And in fact, the interests that we associate with these groups, women's interests or indigenous interests, are not just the responsibility of women and indigenous peoples, but in fact, they're intersectional and they're transversal. So when the Constitutional Convention is debating, say, the economic model, women's interests, indigenous interests, the interests of the poor are all present there. So gender parity is one tool to try to create this more robust discussion and ensure that representation is broadly shared among all members. Concretely, there was a question about um, will they have gender parity in the new constitution and will they have uh, legalized abortion in the new constitution. So there are three Latin American countries right now that have gender parity in their constitution, Bolivia and Ecuador, that was decided in those countries respective constitutional assemblies in about 2007. And Mexico in 2019 voted on a constitutional reform that established gender parity, not just for the Mexican legislature, but for every branch of government at the federal, state, and municipal levels in Mexico, quite dramatic. I would expect that that would be on the table, that a gender parity convention would ask for gender parity in the constitution. And I actually expect that that reform would be easier to achieve, even with a two thirds threshold for approval, than a reform related to abortion. Abortion will likely be introduced, but remember that two thirds threshold where two thirds of the assembly must agree on any provision in the final constitution. So of course, gender parity is controversial because it restricts the seats available to men who have traditionally held power, but in some ways it doesn't touch on religious and moral interests the way abortion does. So while abortion is likely to be introduced, um, I would be surprised if legal abortion entered into the final constitution because of that super majority. And then just to finish by saying, um, there's a lot of sort of discussion in Chile about what happens if the final constitution is this sort of document that broadly grants a very progressive wide ranging package of rights to society that goes beyond the more classic limited liberal constitutions that we see from you know, the 19th century models. And I would just point out that there are plenty of examples of that in the contemporary world, not just from Latin America, but say Canada. And no one says Canada is ungovernable because Canada's charter has a broad set of protections of social and human rights. So I always try to push against some of this sort of pearl clutching about, as I, about the progressiveness of a possible constitution. So thank you. Muchas gracias. Estoy teniendo algunos problemas de conexión. Thank you. Sorry about uh, having some problems of connection, but I was able to follow you. Isabel? Thank you, Claudio. I will be brief. I know it's almost close to time. How to strengthen the political parties? I think we have different levels in which we have to think. I was referring to the law of parties and the reforms. Of course, the role of the electoral laws about the renominal and the proportional and the electoral law has influenced not only in the parties. I was reading that in the chat they mentioned thresholds, but also how they create the coalitions. And if the coalitions would be electoral or uh, adjusting the convenience of the elections depending on the type of election, but also coalitions that are part of a program. And of course, putting away these law or parties and the electoral law and elections law at a constitutional level, you can think about the government or the regime of government and you have different models. Like if you have a parliamentary regime is different from a presidential one. If you think just assume just today that the presidential regime is kept in this new constitution. So what is the space for the parties in a presidential regime that might be maybe different to the one we know now, but will keep the generation of power in the way it is established. And that is particularly important, I think, to think about the Congress role, because where the politics and deliberation of politics uh, go together is in the Congress, and the role of the parties has to do with 
the role of the parliament members and especially in the process of uh, formation of the law that we have observed with more intensity in the last months. That's on one hand. But the other thing is something that is discussed a lot, the role of parties at a territorial level. We, uh, as I said, we have elections on April the 11th that has to do with municipalities, majors, not, uh, regional governors, and it's a way of introducing more inclusion inside of the parties um, people who might not be in the typical parties elite, many of the cases in Santiago City, but they could be like the local territorial leader, and you need to think about the balance. But it's maybe not just a way of thinking of concentration in the Congress itself, but also in the territorial distribution that I think is pretty important, especially because of the way in which the political parties are generated. I have to say that. I think the most interesting discussion is what Manuel Antonio said, that even if you want to strengthen the parties with different types of norms, this uh, representation question is not just inclusion, but also about the type of representation of the one that we need to be in charge to answer in many of these reforms we want to have. Thank you, Isabel. Veronica. Oh, well, yes, I'll try to be brief because I know we are on top of the time. Uh, that's a key point, intersectional. We need to understand uh, as a counter hegemony, as the, this comes from Western feminism. And we need to understand that for indigenous people, for indigenous women with all the diversity, a key element that we cannot exclude from discussion is violence, violence of the state to uh, indigenous women that affected clearly, not just our participation and representation, but also affecting our culture. So if we think about violence that has been exercised in the motherly role, when it is produced in ancestral uh, territories that are um, uh, invaded, defending territory uh, for our language, when it comes into the private arena, violence of the state is an important dimension. Years ago, the Supreme Court in a flagship case, Lorencia Cayuan, a Mapuche woman that has to uh, give birth in a jail, chained, and there was racism, racism. Uh, as she was a poor woman, a woman, and also indigenous woman. So we think the challenge is pretty interesting. Definitely, we have tried in the process of participation in the Constitutional Convention with the criteria, criterion of parity applied to indigenous people that women could have a participation when we uh, say in our voting papers, candidates that are an alternative from the opposite gender in this case, that is corrected eventually, so we have participation. But that participation could be understood under these intersectional criteria, criterion that we are more indigenous women. And we also have the challenge of how can we understand that intersectional situation that we promote constitution or we aim to have a constitution where gender is uh, transversal, equality of gender is transversal to the design of the constitution. And of course, how that for uh, indigenous women has some effect in the territory, in participation, in the social rights definition, in the cultural rights definition, understanding that we are women and we mm, are part of uh, the First Nations, free existing nations and the view of the collective uh, subjects. So the idea is to uh, put out the colonization of the gender discussion to bring a possibility for these uh, divergence of intersectionality. Thank you, Veronica. And Manuel Antonio? Trying to answer um, what um, 
you asked, and also another question from the chat. I think what's at stake here, it's an issue of legitimacy. The issue of legitimacy, and um, we are not going to say, well, this already happened. And what we have in the constitutional project is subject to the constitutionality that is not ensured by and by an important number and also representing change and transformation. If the content do not solve the type of problems that we are talking about, that ties us into a foundational moment or momentum. If this doesn't happen, Constitution will not have legitimacy. In 1925, when they responded to the crisis, the 100-year crisis from the oligarchic society, from the um, um, birth of, of Chile the, after 100 years, so we had to go through military governments, dictatorships, refoundation of the party system. And it's not that some parties were better than others, but uh, they had to go through all this, ups and downs. So 13 years later, after it has been approved, uh, had to be reincarnated into or becoming new political projects that were accepted for 50 or 60 years. So there is an issue that is key to understand. There are things that can, cannot be uh, uh, ensured or it cannot be say, we, we cannot just take them for granted. There is an, a structural issue, inclusion, inequality. We still need to understand that we will have a refoundation of the whole party, political party system and a refoundation or recomposition or rebirth of this system. If this doesn't happen, we will have a legitimacy problem. And a legitimacy problem is that we either have a permanent crisis or we will have another uprising because mobilizing forces and transformation forces will lose strength. So what I wanted to say here is that this is key and one of the ways we do this is fundamental as a fundamental issue and that implies new relations, new relations, new systems with society. And we need to uh, try this during the constitutional pro uh, process with those that are out of the assembly, those that were at the town halls and as uh, the as uh, the, the uh, communist party said uh, they, they were they they said that the communist party went around and surrounded all these uh, uh, town halls but this is not only going through the development model the role of the state and the rights as well of course uh, weather issues etc it has to refer to to the distribution, the core of the political um, arena. And if we have a court, a constitutional court, and if we have an extra majority power to solve issues related to politics, we understand that the constitutional in Chile is a factic power. Uh, it might be the jury, but not democratic or legitimate. So if we have this, it will be useless. It will be useless to have very good statements of right, uh, of, of right if we're going to have mechanisms that will allow uh, them to control the way they, man they, they exercise their rights. So participation mechanism on direct democracy. We need to think that the large two crisis in Chile, dictatorship crisis and the uprising crisis, they were solved by 
direct democracy. And this is something that has been unique and we have to incorporate it. And I have the impression that with during processes and with mechanisms that ensure new content and recomposition uh, or restatement or reestablishment of parties, we will have maybe not a foundational time or momentum, but a process, foundational process that is going to be supported by a constitution. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I think this is very interesting. Uh, there are many ideas around. I will offer the floor to Steve and um, I will continue here. I have to um, put lunch, <laughs> give lunch to my children and come back. But in Chile, we are in uh, the the closure today well we have the closure of the activities in the in the universities and i would like to offer the floor to steve i would like to thank you all thank you all and um we will have new member or the members of the committee coming into this meeting steve the floor is yours and thank you thank you everyone thank you all the panel members will go now for a, a meeting and um, we have uh, we will invite you all to a space of discussion it will be informal an informal um, <clears throat> meeting but i would like to announce that in the next forum we have a space and um, the, the theme is constitutional change and social demand. Can we close the gap? That will be Friday 19, March 19 at 12 Chile time, 10 a.m. Boston time. So thank you so much. We will offer the floor now uh, to those that are staying in the informal discussion.